Welcome to this vodcast from La Trobe University on politics and poetry in ancient Rome. My name is Rhiannon Evans, this is Sonia Worcester, and we're going to talk today about two very significant figures in late Republican Rome, the politician Cicero and the poet Catullus. Now this vodcast runs alongside our iTunes U course on ancient Rome, and Sonia is going to give a full audio lecture on Cicero, on his life and his work. So if you're interested in Cicero, you'll find more on him there. I'm going to start with some brief, brief background on both men, and then we'll talk about how their worlds intersected. If we look at the lives of these two men, Marcus Tullius Cicero and Gaius Valerius Catullus, we can see that their lives intersected. Catullus seems to have not lived very long. He probably died when he was about 30, um, but he, during the whole of his life, Cicero was alive and having a very successful political career. Um, Cicero had come from a very different background to Catullus, though. Cicero had come from a wealthy but not very aristocratic background. Nobody in his family had been a consul before, which was the highest magistracy in Rome. However, he rose to the, the, the consulship. Now, this was very unusual because normally the consulship just got recycled between a very small group of families. So Cicero was what we called a new man a novus homo, and that meant he'd become consul, nobody in his family had before. Catullus was exactly the kind of man you might expect to rise through these ranks and, and get a high magistracy, but he didn't. Um, he came from an elite family uh, from northern Italy, but the most he seems to have got round to doing is being part of the entourage of a governor of a Roman province, the governor of Bithynia, and really he was just a staffer, a hanger-on, uh, in around 57 BCE. Instead, he chose the life of a poet, and this is a kind of rejection of duty to the state, and he chose a particular form of poetry which we call neoteric or new poetry. And Sonia's going to talk now a little about how this might have brought him into some kind of conflict with Cicero. So we're not really sure if the neoterics were a group of poets as such who kind of hung around one another, but it seems to be the case that they were from the way that Cicero talks about them. Now we only really have three references to Cicero, uh, that Cicero makes, excuse me, to the Neoterics. And the first one is in his letter to his friend Atticus. And he says, a very calm wind blowing from Onchesmus blew me from Epirus. And what he seems to be doing in this letter is really making fun of the style of uh, poetry. And as you can see, this is a very verbose and over-the-top way of saying there was a good wind that helped me get from point A to point B. And so what he seems to be doing is labelling these poets as faddish and um, whether or not he's actually criticising them here is not that clear. And uh, later on though, in on oratory, he makes it clear that he really doesn't like this group of new poets and he actually goes to the, he explains to us why he doesn't like them. And he says that they really try too hard. Their style of poetry is over the top. And he tells us that Cicero prefers a style that is less practised. So what he seems to be doing is making a comparison here between traditional Roman styles of poetry and new forms imported from particularly Greek poetry. And so in short, it seems that Cicero really disapproves of Catullus. Now, Catullus himself claims in the opening line of his collection of poems that his style is a very constructed style of poetry. So the first line in poem one is, to whom shall I bestow my new charming little book, just now polished with a dry pumice stone. So this use of the word charming implies something that a lot of effort has been put into, a lot of finesse. It's not just something quickly written down. And the reference to the dry pumice stone, this is how they used to um, rub down the papyri on which the poems would have originally been written. But it also very much implies a style of poetry that's heavily constructed, not natural at all. Now, Cicero, however, really doesn't just disapprove of Catullus for his style of poetry. His issue with Catullus lies with the fact that he is uh, not very traditionally Roman. So not only is his style of poetry very different to traditional, simpler Roman styles of poetry, uh, but 
Catullus himself, with his lack of political involvement, is also a bit un-Roman. The Roman state really relied very heavily on political involvement by members of the elite. So for Catullus to not participate is very much a disavowal of traditional Roman kind of ways of being. Now, this is exactly the same problem that Cicero has with members of the elite who espouse Epicurean philosophy. And Epicurean philosophy argued that the best way to be happy was to live a life of withdrawal, so don't participate in politics. And so this is Cicero, this is a consistent theme in Cicero's work, that he doesn't like members of the elite who don't contribute to Roman politics. Cicero also very much disapproves of the attitude that Catullus has towards love and duty, and we know a lot about Catullus's attitudes to these two themes in his poems. And what Catullus's poetry does is that it actually adopts the language of mil the military and pastoral language to talk about desire and love. And what Catullus does in his poems is he says, I don't really feel a duty to the Roman state. I feel a duty to uh, my love life, basically. And so Cicero has a bit of a problem with the fact that Catullus is not respectful towards the Roman state. So really, Cicero disapproves of Catullus and thinks he's un-Roman because of his lack of political involvement, his emotional openness and his poetic style. Catullus is most famous for his love poetry. And I'm going to talk to you about a number of his very famous love poems. But first, I want to talk you through a poem which actually does engage with a major political figure, and that is Julius Caesar. But as we'll see, it's entirely critical, uh, and it's basically just saying snidey, nasty things about him. And it does also contain some obscenity. This is poem 57. And by the way, we label Catullus's poems just by a number. It, do, it doesn't mean anything about the order in which they were published, which we have no idea about. This is just traditional. So this poem, as I say, very nasty. Uh, Catullus says, they are beautifully matched, the perverse buggers, Mamura, the catamite, and Caesar. And catamite, if you're not familiar with it, means pretty much the same as bugger. He says, it's no surprise, they're both equally dirty. The Romans believed that you could be soiled by the wrong kind of sexual contact and you would be literally dirty and diseased, as he says later in the poem. So he's really having a go at Caesar and a man called Mamura, who was actually with Caesar on campaign in Gaul. He was his chief of engineers and he did things like building bridges over the Rhine. Catullus isn't interested in these very important big state activities. He's interested in their sex lives um, and in having a go at them for their sex lives. He says they are greedy adulterers and that they go for little girls. He's not very consistent with his critique. He, he calls them buggers um, and he says that basically they engage in pederasty, which is what Catamite is suggesting, but that they basically play the part of the boy in boy love, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do as a Roman politician, as a Roman figure uh, who is an adult male. You're meant to be the active participant in sex, and that's really all the Romans care about. They don't care whether you're having sex with uh, a woman or a boy, but you shouldn't be acting the part of a boy, and Caesar shouldn't be doing this. So really, he's having a go at him for acting out the powerless position, for being dirty and diseased, as he calls it. It's very typical, actually, of the kind of critique, the kind of invective that Roman politicians threw around about each other. And Cicero says much the same in some of his speeches about people like Mark Antony. It seems amazing to us that they could go into the Senate and throw around this kind of language, but it was possible and it was their way of getting at each other. And it doesn't actually mean that Catullus thought that Caesar was engaging in this kind of activity. It's a way of insulting him. He, he has a go at Mamura, remember Caesar's chief engineer, in a couple of other poems, including poem 94, where he memorably calls him Mentula. The word Mentula has the same metrical rhythm as Mamura, but it's the Latin word for penis. Uh, and this name play is something that we'll talk about in his other poems as well. As, as an interesting little note, the, the aftermath of all of this was apparently that Julius Caesar forgave Catullus in, entirely. This is what Suetonius, Caesar's biographer, tells us. So Caesar was a lot nicer than Catullus in this episode. 
as I say, that's about as much engagement as we get with political figures from Catullus. It's purely negative. But what he does a lot more of is this very intense love poetry. So let's have a look at that now. One of Catullus's most famous poems is Poem 85. It's as short as a Catullan poem can be. It's only those two lines long. I haven't taken anything out of that. It's absolutely immediate and absolutely to the heart. He says, I hate and I love. It really sums everything up. Right? He's in love with someone, but he hates her as well. Presumably it's a she. He says, why should I do that, you may ask? I don't know, but I feel it and it tortures me. So it's all about feeling. It's all about how excruciating this is for him. The number of times the word I occurs there really is all about I, I, I and what I feel and the terrible emotions that I'm suffering, suffering through love. And we can see why Cicero might have had a problem with this. The Roman elite are meant to be dedicating their lives to the state. Catullus's poetry is all about himself. It's very self-involved. As we can see there, Catullus's view of love isn't that it's always benign, far from it. It can really be a torment. We do see happier poems with Catullus, both happier and sadder ones, I must say. And a lot of the most famous ones involve a love affair that he says he's having with a woman called Lesbia. Uh, now, one of the famous Lesbia poems is poem five, and I've quoted the beginning of that on the slide here. Uh, and it's very immediate again, very intense. So it starts off, let us live, my Lesbia, and let us love. And there's a real equivalence there between living and loving. They're the same thing, apparently, to Catullus. And he distances himself from the kind of men who might be involved in official activities, uh, specifically dealing with money here, with finances. He says, let us count all the talk of stricter old men at a single penny. We don't care about these old people who might disapprove. All we care about is living and loving and each other. And this poem continues with the same kind of immediacy and the same kind of just concern for themselves and rejecting everybody else. So Catullus goes on, suns can set and rise again. For us, once the brief light has set, there is one eternal night for sleeping. So the daytime activities which might include official business, finances, mean nothing to Catullus. Everything is about the night. Everything is about love for him. And this is a poem where he very cleverly takes on that idea of finances and accountancy being boring daytime stuff. And he applies it to these nighttime activities, but in a way that says, we won't care about counting out. We won't care about numbers. So he says, give me a thousand kisses, then a hundred. And then the bit of the poem I've cut out just keeps saying that. Then another thousand, another hundred, and so many that we can't count them, basically. So many thousands, we'll mix them up so we don't know. We don't know how many kisses there are. There'll be so many. And he imagines as, 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 as though there's somebody watching on here. Nor can some evil man envy us when he knows how many kisses there are. That's actually the end of the poem. And it's this idea that there is this, this envious figure looking on, maybe one of the stern men who's doing the accounting. And Lesbia and Catullus don't care about him. And love can't just be counted out. There are so many kisses that he's not going to know. And you can't just write it down in a book. And passion is really all that matters here for Catullus. It's very intense, very moving, very emotional. However, if we look at the, the less happy side of love, we get a lot of that with Catullus. Um, because he talks about what happens when his lover betrays him uh, in several of his poems. But in this one, uh, which I've given you the end of, he's, he's talking to two friends. He's relying on them for support when his love affair breaks down. And his girlfriend here, she's not named as Lesbia, but it kind of makes sense that it might refer to her, as I'll discuss. She's represented as unfaithful in a, a great degree, in a kind of extreme way. But he's asked his friends to go and give her a message. He says to them, tell my girl this in a few ill-omened words. So give her some insults. And what he says to pass on to her is, let her live. So very much like the previous poem, poem five that I talked about, let us live. 
but this time it's let her live on her own, although not on her own, because she'll be happy with her adulterers, embracing all 300 of them together. So as if she's having sex with 300 men at the same time. Uh, it's truly extreme. But it's entirely loveless, loving none truly. So she's just in it for the sex. And again, you get slightly obscene, breaking the, the groins of all again and again. So she's just having sex and more sex and more sex. And it, it, he's really showing her to be a, a whore here, basically. However, the poem has this streak of anger through it. But Catullus is very good at changing tone. And he changes from the tone of anger to one of, that's quite a lyrical ending. Uh, so the last stanza imagines, uh, and this makes absolute psychological sense to us still, I think, imagines that she might come crawling back. And he says, no, I'm just, I'm not going to take you back if you come back. He says, let her not look for my love as before, she whose crime destroyed it. So he depicts her as a criminal because she's betrayed him in love. And he ends with a very moving image. He says, like the last flower of the field, touched once by the passing plough. And I think that's a really beautiful image, which in, in a basically very angry poem, um, which actually displays Catullus, if you think about it in this simile, he's very powerless because he's like the flower who's been destroyed by the plough. And the plough, of course, is big and powerful, and I guess is, is the, the girlfriend who's betrayed him in this poem. Um, and he's sort of collateral damage. The plough isn't there to plough up flowers, but it'll clip off the flower. A lot of people read this poem, by the way, as an analogy with castration, that the clipping off the, the flower is like castrating Catullus. So he's put himself in a powerless position here, and he's shown how devastating love can be, that he, can't, he almost can't survive it. Okay, I want to talk now about Lesbia again and some Im important facts about where we think Catullus got her name from. And he's making really a clever literary illusion because he took the name Lesbia from the name of an island, that is the island Lesbos, which is in the eastern Mediterranean uh, of the Greek world, but just off Turkey now. Um, and the reason he took her name from Lesbos is that it was where the poet Sappho lived. Sappho was a Greek poet who lived about 500 years before Catullus, but similarly wrote about love poetry in a very intense, passionate way. Now, Sappho is quite famous for writing poems to women, so uh, female lovers, but she actually wrote poems to male lovers as well. She's most famous for writing those poems about um, female love to us, but in antiquity, she just seems to have been famous as someone who writes about love in an intense way. And this, I think, is what Catullus is calling on, what he's recalling for us when he names Lesbia, Lesbia. All right, so he wants us to see that sequence of Lesbia, Lesbos, Sappho, and he's making that connection with her. And we can see that connection very strongly in this last poem that I'm going to look at with you, which is poem 51, which we know is based on a Sappho poem. Now, almost every poem we have of Sappho's is fragmentary, and this one is no exception, although it's, it's not as fragmentary as some. Sometimes we only have a word or half a line. But we can tell that it's very closely modeled, this poem of Catullus on Sappho's. It's almost a translation, but it's a very artful translation. And it's quite a complex poem because it sets up a kind of triangle, not quite a love triangle, but it starts off with the poet looking or talking about a man. So the same thing happens in the Sappho poem. It looks like there might be a male love interest here because he says, he seems equal to the gods to me, that man, if it is possible, more than just divine. So you look at someone and think, wow, they're more than a god. But he's not actually the love object. And Catullus does occasionally write uh, poems to male love objects. But he's not the love object here. He's the man who is sitting opposite you, endlessly seeing you and hearing you. And you are laughing so sweetly that with fierce pain I'm robbed of all my senses because that moment I see you, lesbia. Lesbia is the love object and nothing is left to me. Okay, so as I say, there's a triangle set up here where 
Catullus can't believe how this man, he must be a god if he can sit there and not be overwhelmed by Lesbia. She is so amazing. She's so seductive. What happens to Catullus on the other hand? Well, there's a line missing. I haven't left something out there. There is actually, this is fragmentary too. Ironically, this poem seems to be fragmentary in exactly the same place as Sappho's. But what happens to Catullus is clearly being described in the last stanza. My tongue is numbed and through my poor limbs, fires are raging. The echo of your voice rings in both ears. My eyes are covered with the dark of night. So all his senses have gone. He can't hear, he can't see, he can't speak, he can't move. Love or just looking at Lesbia has completely overwhelmed him. And this, this is like the other poems that we've seen of Catullus about love. We see that he, he can't act independently. He can't act rationally. He can't act in a way that would be any use to the state after all, because love just takes him over. He gives himself over entirely to the emotional life. So there's a real visceral reaction to love here. Uh, and this, is, this poem really sums everything up. The debt that he owes to Sappho, the fact that he is overwhelmed by lesbia, the fact that his entire life is given to emotions. Okay, now thinking about lesbia, um, Sonia and I are going to have some discussion about where we think uh, lesbia might have been a real person in ancient Rome. This is a, there's a lot of scholarly debate on this, um, but there's a real desire to want to think about who was the real lesbia. Did she exist? So Sonia is going to introduce the background to this topic uh, and say where we think lesbia might have been or where some people think lesbia might have been in ancient Rome. So one of the main reasons why we think Lesbia and Clodia might have been the f same person or we'd like to think they were is a piece of evidence from a second century orator called Apuleius. And Apuleius says, therefore, in the same manner, they should accuse Catullus because he called Clodia Lesbia. So that's really the primary piece of evidence that we have that Clodia and Lesbia might have been the same person. Now, within a con this, the right context, what Apuleius is doing here is he's actually defending himself from the charge that he uses or hides the identities of those he's talking about by using aliases. And he says, well, if you're going to give me a hard time about it, then you need to give a hard time to people like Catullus, because he also hides the identities of those he's writing about. Now, the problem that we have with Apuleius as a source is that we don't know where he got this information from. So he might have actually just made it up that, Apule that Collodia and Lesbia were the same person. So he's not overly reliable. Another reason that scholars think that Clodia and Lesbia might have been the same person is the representation of Clodia in Cicero's text, the Procaglio. Now, this is a speech, a defence speech of a young man that Cicero gave and one of the charges against Caelius is that he had an affair with this woman Clodia and the way that Cicero describes Clodia is very sim similar to the way that Catullus describes Lesbia. So here I say nothing against that woman. Again you'll notice the absence of naming here but he's talking about Clodia but let us suppose that there is another woman different from her who gives herself freely to everybody. So this is very similar to Catullus's comment that Lesbia is having you know sex with 300 men and um, I mean everybody who always has a lover to show off. I've deleted a bit of text there that she is a hussy and lives brazenly that she is a wealthy woman and lives extravagantly that she is a slave to her appetites and lives like a whore. So that's rather similar to Catullus's insult to Lesbia once they've broken up, that she's basically a prostitute. Should I consider a man an adulterer if he takes a little liberty when he meets her? So that's in reference to Caelius and Cicero's trying to say, Caelius can't really be charged with having an affair with Clodia because she was having sex with everyone anyway. Now, Cicero actually uses the term prostitute in the Procaglio more than any other Latin text that we have extant today. Um, so that's one reason why scholars think that Clodia and Lesbia might have been the same person. And as I said, this imagery of adultery also contributes to this overall idea. 
Now, Clodia, as you can see, is represented by Cicero as a woman who is completely ruled by her lust and desire. So, and that's a similar reoccurring theme that we have in Catullus' poems. So this idea that they kind of belong to the same social group gets supported by the fact that Clodia seems to be driven by her lust and passion. And she also lives a very luxurious lifestyle, which again is somewhat antithetical to traditional Roman ideas about living quite a simple life. So the question is, can we really say that Clodia and Lesbia are the same person? Um, well, I don't think either of us think that this, we can be conclusive about this, but there are, let, let me raise some of the problems. There are problems with talking about Clodia, the name Clodia, because of Roman naming customs, which were very boring in our terms, because any daughter of an elite man basically took on a female version of his name. So Clodia had two sisters and they would have been called Clodia too. So she's known as Clodia Metelli because she married a man called Metellus, but there were two other Clodias at least floating around at the same time that Cicero is writing this speech and, and Catullus is alive. And there would have been other families with the same name too. So there are any number of other Clodias. Um, there's the problem that Apuleius is writing a lot later. He's writing in the second century CE. Uh, there's also, I think, some problems in terms of the way that Cicero is using the very traditional ways of representing women. What do you, what do you think about that, Sonia? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I think it would be lovely if we could say Clodia and Lesbia were the same person, but Cicero has an agenda with the way that he's representing Clodia and it's simply his role is to get Caelius off the charge that he's in court for. So he is trying to refocus the entire case onto Clodia and away from Caelius and he does that by focusing on her sexuality and her lifestyle as a way of showing that she's an unreliable witness. I don't think it would He's, he's just picked up kind of stereotypical characteristics of women who are threatening and use those to kind of have a go at, at Clodia. I don't think that because they happen to match up with the traits of lesbia that that's enough evidence to we, say that they're the same. <laughs> we could argue that Catullus is using the same stereotype because exactly. after all, we don't know whether someone called lesbia existed at all or mm. someone he called lesbia. We don't know if he had a love affair all we know is what he writes in his poetry. And after all, do you believe everything that people write in their poetry when they use the word I? And I, I often try make the analogy to a modern pop song. Just because somebody sings in a pop song that they're going through a tragic love breakdown doesn't mean it's actually happening in their life. All right? They write that and sing it so they can get in the pop charts. And Catullus might have written this poetry because he wanted to write highly emotional poetry. And he might have invented lesbia for that reason. So he's using the same kind of rhetoric that Cicero does. But it sure. doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same person. No. The only thing that sort of muddies the waters is this Catullus poem 79. And in it he says, Lesbius is beautiful. So that's the male form of the name, uh, Lesbia, sorry. And obviously Clodius brother was called Clodius and his full name was Clodius Pulcher, so Clod uh, Clodius the Beautiful. So you could see this Lesbius is beautiful as being a reference to Clodius. And then he says, so what? Well, Lesbia prefers him. And there was actually a charge levelled against Clodius and Clodia that they um, had an incestuous relationship with one another. So whether that's what this poem is referring to here, and then, of course, uh, Catullus says, rather than you, Catullus, and your whole family. So uh, Clodia, or Lesbia, prefers uh, her own brother, or having a love affair with her own brother, apparently, to having one with Catullus. So, I mean, again, I wouldn't want to go out and say, yes, this, is, this helps prove that Clodia and Lesbia are the same person, but it certainly confuses the issue a little bit. When it, it is quite suggestive. Yes. But again... Cicero is using, a little bit like Catullus did in that poem that I showed about Caesar, he's using the kind of invective that exactly. we see. You use that charge against people because they're your political enemy, because you don't like them, because you decide you want to criticise them. Right. Um, so in conclusion, I'm sorry, it's not an absolute conclusion. We can't really say that Lesbia is Clodia. Um, you will actually read that in a lot of books, though. Some scholarly books, and not even very old books, will just say... Lesbia is this real-life woman called Clodia. 
who lived this disgusting lifestyle. They're often quite moralistic about her in ways that I don't think is very helpful with studying antiquity. Um, so just to sum up, Sonia and I are, are going to sum up with what we think we can learn from looking at Cicero and Catullus. I think they're really important in terms of seeing what's, what's significant to Roman elite men in the late Republic. Um, so this concentration on the idea of duty or whether you reject duty, what kind of lifestyle you live, if you are an elite man, should you go forward and have a political career? That debate, I think, is going on in Cicero and Catullus. Um, what else do you think is significant about looking at Cicero and Catullus, Sonia? Well, I think it kind of indicates that this is a very transformative period in Roman history. And you see all those cultural influences that have kind of been slowly coming into Rome for a couple of hundred years. They suddenly have a major impact in the late Republic and you have a divergence in the way that people want to express themselves. So you have Cicero who, as a new man, is trying to say, I'm actually very traditional and I'm not threatening as a new man. Then you have Catullus who comes from an old family who doesn't want to follow in the traditions that have kind of sustained Rome and so you get this tension between two different sorts of, of Roman identities really. And, and it is the late Republic. We call it the late Republic because it's about to end. Um, Catullus and Cicero didn't know that but they could sort of see that this was a time of transition and that there was an awful lot of conflict between political individuals. And for a lot of Romans, particularly people like Cicero, they put that down to a moral decline. They thought that it was because many of the Roman elite were acting like Catullus, perhaps, weren't carrying out their duty, that this was going to lead to the inevitable end of the Republic. And it did end, probably not for that reason, much more to do with the political struggles between people like Caesar and Pompey the Great. But that's what the Romans thought. They thought that this kind of behavior, this kind of conflict was going to mean the collapse of their state or the collapse of their state as they knew it. So we can see that very clearly in the conflict between Cicero and Catullus and their ways of life there. Okay, um, we hope you've enjoyed that conversation that we had together. And if you want to find out more about what we're doing in Mediterranean studies at La Trobe, you can um, look at our website or join in through Facebook or Twitter. Thank you.